Thank you for coming, everyone. I'm Patty Sellers. I'm one of the producers of the film. And this is Professor Brian Owensby of the University of Virginia, and an expert on Latin America, and a man who lived in Bogota for five years during her childhood. Yes, uh, my family and I moved to uh, Mexico in uh, the early 60s, and then after Mexico, we went and lived in Bogota until I was 15 when I returned to this country. Anyway, you're kind of in charge of this. So I, kind of, I kind of did the right. first word, which I probably shouldn't have, but... <laughs> well, so see, seeing all of the images and, and, and listening to Juan Manuel Santos talk sort of, uh, sort of gets me a little bit right here just because uh, I've lived in so many, I've lived in the place where, where, where he lived, I've seen the city and know that I know the city and when we lived there, the kind of violence that, that he was describing was only just beginning to take off and it was something that was confined to the rural areas. Um, and something that hadn't yet reached the cities. There were just beginning to be concerns about kidnappings. Um, I was, my family was not concerned about that. My parents were missionaries and they don't kidnap missionary kids because missionaries don't have any money. Um, but oil executives and those types, uh, those, that was the beginning of the period in which uh, foreigners began to worry about what might happen. talked about what we should be doing here in terms of having a conversation. Oh, hold on. So are you kind of interviewing me? Or how are we, how are we well, doing what this? What, what I'm interested in is, is to understand how you came to, um, to, want me, to want to do this movie. You know, I, maybe it's personal connections, but I'm interested to hear how it came. Sure. Came so I spent my career writing for Fortune magazine over 30, 30 years. I am a business writer by background. I graduated from UVA in 1982. I was an English major. I wanted to become a journalist. I fell into business journalism and in the process of those 30 years being a business journalist, I wrote a lot about, I wrote a lot about leaders and I tended to write mostly about people rather than companies. So I came to understand leadership pretty well. Um, today, I stopped writing for Fortune in, uh, at the end of 2015, and uh, still have a small role with Fortune, but not writing. And um, started a company in 2016 with um, a very renowned political journalist named Nina Easton, who was the top Washington editor of Fortune. And we got a call in 2017 from a friend and advisor to President Santos in the United States. The first question was, do you know who Juan Manuel Santos is? And I said, what we tend to say when we really don't know we want to act smart. Um, sounds familiar. <laughs> and it sounded a tiny bit familiar. Well, President Santos had just won the Nobel Peace Prize the year before. He was at the time the president of Colombia. He was a year away from the end of his two-year, eight-year term, which ended in August of 18. And he was just a couple of weeks away from being the commencement speaker here at the university. And his son Esteban, who is the dark-haired son, graduated from UVA in 2017. So the assignment was, uh, we, do, we do storytelling around leadership and impact for clients. And President Santos wanted a short film for his post-presidency. Do you do that? Can you do that? Yes, we can. We hired an Emmy Award-winning director. We went to Columbia. We got amazing access, as you saw. We got Tony Blair and Bill Clinton, who are huge fans, as you now know, to be, to, to be interviewed, to, inter to let us interview them which we did in the United States. I interviewed Bill Clinton in New York in his Harlem office. And we got a great story. And we produced a short film for the president. 
and he is now using it on his post-presidential speaking tour and his various activities. And we had a lot of great footage. And basically, he allowed us to buy the raw footage for a dollar and do what we want with it. And this is what we did with it. And we are now showing it in film festivals, and we are trying to sell this. If anybody wants to buy it, and <laughs> put it on Netflix. So that's the evolution. And it's, it was a very organic process, because we did not anticipate doing a film this long. But we had great stuff. And he gave us, you know, he trusted us. And he had no approval on this film. Right. He, 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 right. he likes it. I mean, how can you not? Well, one of the things I found interesting about this is you think about people who were put in these very, very difficult situations like he was. And, and if you know anything about the history of Colombia, it's, it's hard to imagine um, uh, another president of Colombia in history who, has taken, who took the position that he did. Um, there, as he, as he, if you recall, he went down the corridor of portraits of Colombian presidents and pointed to all of the presidents who had tried to forge some kind of a peace uh, during the long, long Civil War um, that, that arguably began in the middle of the 20th uh, century. And all of them had been train wrecks. Um, in part because no one had ever actually thought to try to do what he did, which was to really forge ahead with the peace and actually talk to the guerrillas. One of the ironies of the film, I think, is, is that moment after near the end of the film, when he says, they called me a traitor to my class. And in saying that, what he was, what he was trying to communicate was the extent to which this was quite a break with the Colombian political class. The, the, the revolutions or the civil wars that he described during the 19th century were largely civil wars between liberals and, um, and, uh, and conservatives. Um, over who was going to control the countryside and who was going to control the peasantry, and specifically who was going to control the land. And in the middle of the 20th century, a politician by the name of Jorge Eliezer Gaetan, uh, who emerged from a, a petty bourgeois background, so he was not a member of the upper crust, emerged as a populist politician, but a populist in the Latin American sense, not in the more recent, sort of uh, uh, early 21st century sense of populist. And Jorge Eliezer Gaitan challenged the political establishment. And one of the things that he said he was going to do is that he was going to bring the people of the lower classes into politics, the people from the rural areas. And he pushed land reform in particular. Now, for a variety of reasons, and this remains a matter of debate among Colombian historians to this day, uh, Jorge Eliezer Gaitan was assassinated in 1948. And this led to a, uh, a riot in Bogota, and it unleashed a war in Colombia uh, that took the lives of 125,000 people and lasted for the better part of three years, and in some ways could be considered to be the origins of the violence that then followed upon that. One of the reasons that it is often said that Gaitan was assassinated was precisely because he was, he was betraying and if you saw the, if you read Spanish and you saw the signs and some of the no campaign, the, some of the no campaigners, I mean, they refer to him as a traitor, to Juan Manuel Santos as a traitor, in much the same way that they said that Gaitan had been as well. So for someone like Santos, who is obviously from the upper crust, you know, they own the major newspaper in Bogota and so forth, to take the position that he did um, was really quite a break, and I think shocking to a lot of Colombians. More shocking, I think, even than he may have understood. Because the remarkable part of this is that he does lose the vote um, to ratify the peace. It's important to understand where the yes votes and the no votes came from. The countryside overwhelmingly supported him. The people who were the victims of this gruesome violence uh, overwhelmingly supported him. The no votes came from cities. Um, outside of major cities, Cali, Bogotá, and Barranquilla. But they came from the more regional cities, um, where there were, in addition to the concern about going too light on the, on the guerrillas, there was also a concern about whether the government might move to take back land that had been um, ill-gotten 
in the course of the, of, the, uh, of the Civil War. Very often when displaced people left their lands because they were threatened with death, the landowners in the area would grab the land for themselves and did not want to give it back. Now Santos didn't propose any kind of reversal of that, but there were fears that something like that might happen. The document of the piece is a stirring document to read, almost constitutional in its quality. Um, and I think it represented enough of a threat to enough people in Colombia and to the political class that there were a lot of people who were, uh, who were willing to vote no, even at the risk of falling back into the violence that they had just overcome. You know, and you think about, so you get an award. But the Nobel Peace yeah, Prize the Nobel. really made a difference. I mean, this film shows so many things. It shows that one man can make a difference. It shows that a global recognition can turn the tide of a country and um, allow him to make the progress that he had hoped to make. Um, one of the fascinating things to me was this fact that he turned from defense minister and a man of war to a man of peace. And I, in my 30 plus years of covering business, and, you know, I mean, I've interviewed plenty of sort of uh, prominent politicians, government people on stage, and, and in Britain over the years. Um, and outside of business, but you rarely see that. You rarely see something like that. And for someone of that stature to hide it from his own people, they did not, his own brother didn't predict that he would make that turn. And um, that was one of the fascinating things to me. Well, it's, it's hard to underestimate what it was to live in the Colombia of the 1980s and the 1990s when when this violence was going on. I mean, it was day to day, the grinding violence of the tabloids, which would splash the blood all over the front pages. Um, and it was day after 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 day. And there was, and, and while there was some violence in the cities, most of the violence was taking place in the countryside. There were bombs in the cities and so forth, but uh, there, was, there was a broad sense that something was deeply, deeply wrong. And Santos grew up in this, in this context. Um, and exactly what led to this pivot, I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, I, when I met him here, he seemed a man of, of uh, as his wife kept saying, of, well, in Spanish the word is coherencia, but it sort of means of, of consistency of conviction and views. Mm -hmm. um, who took seriously what he was trying to accomplish. Yeah, I mean, his wife sees him as a man who was always on a path to peace. Who has a question or a comment? Um, yes, back here. Mm -hmm. Yes, you. So, mm -hmm. the first popular referendum failed, and then the community seemed to indicate that they renegotiated and they, didn't, they just went to Congress to right. pass the referendum. Yes, and Brian probably, he knows, he's more of an expert on Colombian politics than I am, but if you could, yes. Yeah, so the referendum fails. Uh, it was only six days after the peace was announced. There hadn't been much time. Uh, there had been deep suspicion of it to begin with, and what we don't get a sense of here is the extent to which he understood how close it might be. You know, his Minister of the Environment says, you know, we, we came to the palace in order to celebrate. We thought we were going to be having a party and we were going to be celebrating the victory. And lo, uh, it turned out the, the other way. Um, I think he really did not understand just how deep the opposition to it was. So can you talk a little bit about the, the thought process of, well, we're not going to put it in front of the people again. I mean, the renegotiated settlement. So that seems like... Go straight to Congress. Yeah, so... What, what happened was that he went back to, he went back to the FARC um, and, and he said, we've come too far to be able to just give this up now. Um, is there a way in which we can try to push forward, notwithstanding the negative vote? And 
my understanding is that part of what he said in FARC was, you know, look, we lost, but by a very narrow margin, half of the Colombian people um, are deeply in favor of this. And it was not clear just how monolithic the opposition was. There were a variety of reasons why people opposed or voted no on the initial referendum, sent it back to Congress, uh, and it was voted overwhelmingly uh, in Congress. The renegotiated version. And there was resentment about that. And I mean, Brian, you can ask me. You can ask me the question that you asked out in the hallway if you if you care to. Well, so you know, if, to the extent that this is a movie about leadership, one of the one of the obvious questions this raises is: Could it also be? I, I think it was an immense success. Something like this had never happened in Colombia before, and it was courageous and it was risky. But you could also ask whether it wasn't simultaneously a failure of leadership. So what were the terms of the agreement? I mean, this was not talked about at all, I mean, other than turning over guns. I mean, we're, you know, you might be standing next to somebody who yesterday was killing your family, and there he was, you know, whatever. What was he doing? Right. Well, there is a an extremely long list of conditions that were part of this peace agreement, and. Um, Santos's opposition won the vote, became, you know, the, the current president, Duque, took office in August. And um, he is a Santos opponent and an opponent of the peace deal. And I think about a third of the conditions have been met. About a third. About a third. Yeah. And uh, splinter groups of FARC are reorganizing and violence is increasing and that raises the question is this man is this a is this a story of leadership success or ultimate failure i mean as bill clinton says um it is up to the people of colombia to determine whether this success will continue and we really don't know yet do we no we don't um although it's not looking Right now, especially among the southern the southern border, violence is growing, and it's such a porous place along the southern border with um, with uh, with Brazil. And it's not clear what will happen, and also the border with Venezuela is a tin box. Yeah, Venezuela is uh, making things messier, certainly. But another thing that's interesting about this is that there's a whole other aspect to this that wasn't mentioned at all in the movie. He says, you know, this is a war against the FARC. Well, it was a war against the FARC. The FARC you know, organized in the 1970s and launched this war to try to take over the state. But it was also, it, it morphed into something else. It, more than half of, the, of, of all of the killings that have been done in the context of the war were actually done by paramilitary groups. The state itself, or elements of the state itself. And there's no, there, except at the beginning, there was, a, there was a very short reference to the paramilitaries. But the paramilitaries have been in, in every way just as bad, if not worse, than the, than the FARC. The obvious problem is that you can't negotiate with yourself to stop a civil, you can, the state can't negotiate with itself to stop a civil war that it cannot acknowledge because it's being conducted by members of the state itself. And so this wasn't a part of, this couldn't be a part of the movie, I'm sure it was part of his calculations, in some way or another that is not really discussed here at all. But it does suggest just how complex a situation it was, and how dicey um, the, his accomplishment really was. It was an accomplishment, but now we're beginning to see just how weak and tenuous it may have been. Which is an unfortunate thing to say. Yes, back here. Mm -hmm. It's a really great question, and we talked to opponents and some 
people you know, associated with FARC off camera. We did not shoot them because, quite frankly, um, this began as a project for, you know, supporters of the president. We did not really anticipate doing an independent film out of this. Um, as I said, we realized we had such good stuff and we, we decided subsequently to do a film that, and as I said, there was no, we, we established at the start, like, okay, if we're going to do something more, you could not have approval over this, but we weren't going to go back and do, we ended up spending a lot of our own money to make it much longer, but we didn't go back to Bogota, it's, you know, and film other people. As is often the case in these kinds of things, especially when they've been going on for so long, at a certain point, people continue to fight because they fight. Um, the FARC, my, my sense of what I read in the press and so forth, is that the vast majority of the members of the FARC are not dying to get back to the jungle. They're not dying to get back to the fight. Um, but on the other hand, the, what, one of, the, one of the, the, the parts of the agreement that was implemented was to create places, safe, basically secure zones, where ex-guerrillas could go and live, having turned over their arms, they, were, they, were, uh, they, they, they had um, military units nearby to protect them from paramilitary units and others who might seek their vengeance against them. Um, but th the money for that is about to run out. And a number of these communities have been told, you guys are going to have to move. Even though they've already put down roots, they've begun to grow things, they're acting like farmers and, and so forth, they're being told, you have to move. And oftentimes, with the new president, it seems they're being asked to move to places where they know they will be at physical risk. Especially because there are known paramilitary units nearby who may very well decide to take it out on the guerrillas. Um, I think we're getting the signal. They're doing another screening here after this. And we really, really appreciate your coming. And I have a, I have a few friends here who are sort of friends of friends and um, a couple of uh, uh, sons of friends of mine who are students here who I don't even know. So you just have to promise to come up to me uh, before you walk out the door and say hello. But thank you all for coming and uh, it, as a UVA grad from 82, it's a real honor to do this with you, Brian, thank right you. here. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> it, was, it, was very, it was very nice.